Well, guys, I want to thank you for tuning in and making this podcast a part of your day today. I'm your host, Ryan Sebastian, and I am joined with my co-host, David Pinkham. Happy December, y'all. We made it to the last month of 2020. Congratulations. (laughs) Thank goodness. This has been a very interesting year Mm -hmm. by far, and I never want to see 2020 again. (laughs) Ever again. (laughs) Yes, I'm looking forward to 2020 being hindsight forever. Yes, and (laughs) I'm looking forward to hopefully 2021 being a phenomenal year, but we'll see. Yep. Well, hey, we have a God who can do incredible things, and so I'm looking forward to seeing what he's going to do in and through us next year. Absolutely, and and, uh, let's just pray. Now, this whole COVID situation goes away quickly. Because I don't know if, about you and those of you who are listening, I am sick and tired of COVID. Mm, amen. I'm ready for normal, well, not normal, but more closer to normal type of ministry, whatever that's going to look like. Um, I'm looking forward to the ability to, to do activities and events and not have to sit here and worry about keeping people socially distanced and wearing masks and all this crazy stuff that we're dealing with right now. I'm just looking for just, just playing an event like I normally do and just go at it. Mm. Yep. I hear you, man. We'll we'll get there slowly but surely. Well, guys, I I am really excited about who we're going to be interviewing. Uh, or I should say we have interviewed yep. uh, because I have to say this person has been somebody I have been a fan for a long time for this person, this person's band that he's a part of. Mm-hmm. And that is John Cooper and with the band Skillet. I am a huge Skillet fan. Yep. I've been been following them since I was in about about middle school. It's like nineties. Yeah. When I got first got introduced to them. Uh and when I was a kid, the one of my favorite albums back then was Alien Youth. Mm-hmm. And those of you who are listening were not familiar with Skillet, look it up. It was a very interesting album. It was very different, especially for Christian genre type of music, Christian hard rock. Yeah, And I, I just remember loving it. It was different. I was looking for something different because Christian music, I got to be honest with you in the, in the 90s was, was horrible. <laughs> I, I, I'm Says just, you. I loved it. <laughs> now, of, course, of course, I like, I like DC Talk and Audio Drilling oh, yeah. and all those guys. But the vast majority of Christian music, when you're a hard rock metal guy uh, like I am, I love that, yeah. that genre. You just couldn't find it. I'll, I'll give you that. Did you have the, the Alien Youth um, poster up in your youth room on the wall? You know what's, you know what's kind of funny you say that? Because it's, yes, we did. <laughs> I think we did too. Because <laughs> I, I, I made sure my past, my youth pastor had that. It's like, oh, cool. You got it. You got it. Because I, I was a preacher's kid. So I can have a little mo- more say on some of the decor that we had in our youth room. And yes, I did encourage our youth pastor to get that poster to put it up absolutely that's awesome man well guys i I, i'm super excited of of the topic we we're going to be talking to with uh john today because because a lot of people don't know this but john cooper is very active uh when it comes to cultural issues uh where we're at as a country and how that affects us as believers and as christians and and he, he addresses things like cancel culture uh, woke, this new thing that's coming out, woke and racism and all these other uh, topics and issues that have been popping up in our culture. Really, I think it's been popping up more in the last uh, 10 years, but really in the last couple of years, it's been, people have been screaming this, these issues. 
Um, so he really addresses a lot of the stuff. And he's he just recently written a book uh, called Awake and Alive to Truth. It's a phenomenal book that's being released, if I remember correctly. It's being released this week, if I remember correctly. I believe so. And it, it is, a, again, I'm looking forward to getting this book in my hand as well because it's addressing all these issues. And so just a great tool to put into a teenager's hands um, as they wrestle with culture and, and how can I, as a believer in Christ, still be, uh, be a believer and how does that impact my culture, uh, basically my belief my, uh, and my faith? How does that correlate with our culture today? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I like the way that he, he lays it out. And I'm looking forward to reading uh, the whole book. Uh, I've, I got the Black Friday deal, so I'm getting a journal with it. <laughs> oh, you stink. But, I, already pre- I pre-ordered mine a long time ago. I waited for Black Friday just in case. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, man, I'm looking forward to it. Well, guys, stay tuned as we talk with John Cooper. Guys, I am super pumped up and excited about our interview today. We're going to interview uh, someone who I have been following since I was in middle school, and that is Woo-hoo. John Cooper from Skillet. <laughs> middle school, I love it. <laughs> so, so I am yep. super pumped up. I'm super pumped up uh, for basically what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about something that. I feel like it's really important, and that is culture today. And we're really going to be talking about a book that John has just uh, wrote, and we're going to be released here in the next couple of weeks, and that's Awake and Alive to Truth. So, so John, just in case if there's someone here who is listening who maybe has been well, living under a rock, doesn't know who you are, how about you share a little bit about your story, your journey with Skillet, and how God is using your podcast. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. If there are people like that, as you say, sinners, sinners <laughs> out there that don't know who Skillet is, I, I got to drop some knowledge on you here. All right. So um, let's see. Skillet started 1996. And uh, I cannot believe we're still a band. I never thought it would last that long. Um, but uh, I love music. I've always loved music. When I was growing up, I think that I don't want to, I don't know if it's fair to say that music played a, I think music played a different kind of role in people's lives, probably in 70s, 80s, 90s than now, because music was basically, it was, it identified you. That's, that's how you, all your friends listen to the same music, everything in life was, oh, there's a brand new, you know, uh, Kiss album, brand new Motley Crue album, and you'd go and you'd wait at 6 a.m. until the record store opened so you could go home and listen to the record. So music was a huge part of my life. And I always believed that, that God uh, used music to, I just believe that God used music because I believe that God created music to glorify himself, right? And so I always felt it was a real shame that music glorified man and it glorified the enemy. It glorified sin. It glorified just absolute hedonistic behavior. And I, I loved the idea of having a band that, that people could listen to and identify with, but it would be giving glory to God. And it would be singing songs that people could relate to. And they say, I feel that same way. And through that vehicle, we could sort of, you know, help reclaim music for Christ because the devil doesn't create music, right? <laughs> God creates music, but reclaim it and put it under the Lordship of Christ. That is what I really wanted to do with Skillet. And we've had the amazing privilege of meeting thousands of people who say they've either given their life to Christ through our music, or that it helped keep their faith strong. Some people that said it, it saved their life, they wanted to commit suicide, they heard a song. I met someone who said, I heard your song, uh, an atheist, heard your song on the radio, on secular radio, and he said, I heard that song and I just had a feeling in my heart that I needed to go check in to rehab. He said, I've been addicted to mm-hmm. meth for three years. And there's a song, it was, the song was called Sick of It. That was, mm-hmm. uh, are you sick of it? And he was like, I was like, yes, I'm sick of it. 
that was the song that checked into rehab. And after three years of rehab, he ended up giving his life to Christ uh, because it was one of those Christian, uh, Christian rehab facilities where, where God is, a, is like a founding pillar of how, you know, you, you get rid of that addiction. That's kind of a random story, but it's pretty powerful stuff, right? So I've just been passionate about sharing Christ. And as the years have gone by, I've seen more and more and more absolute confusion coming into the world and into the church. The church is not, you know, uh, really guarded as she should be against the, the, the relativism of the world, the postmodernism of the world. All of these atheistic worldviews have now come into the church and I saw personal friends of mine walk away from the faith within the last 10 years. Um, Christian music friends of mine that have been doing Christian music for 10 years, ministering for 10, 20 years, all of a sudden go, I'm not into the Jesus thing anymore. Or they say, I'm into Jesus, but I don't believe the Bible anymore, mm-hmm. um, which is not possible, by the way. We can get into that later. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you feel me? Anyway, yeah. and oh, yeah. I've seen that. I saw friends of mine who cheated on their spouses and I had one friend that cheated on his wife. He had three kids, one on the way was cheating on his wife and said, yeah, but John, here's the deal. I don't think the woman I'm married to is actually my soulmate. I think God gave me this other girl because that's who he wanted me to be with. I'm like, bro, what Bible are you reading? And so I got really passionate about doing my podcast, about writing a book. What can I do to help just train people that aren't geniuses? Cause I'm not a genius on the simple Bible truths that never, ever change that you can build your life on. Like, like Jesus himself said, that you can build your life on the rock and that when the winds come and the rains come, that you won't be shaken. So that's, I hope, not t- talking too long, but that's my story. No, no that's, that's awesome. I, I love it. In fact, I'm glad you brought up that one um, person that told you about the rehab because I told a friend of mine uh, this week that we were interviewing you and uh, he was a friend from high school that just reconnected with me less than a year ago. And he said, dude, they kept me from committing suicide. And I was like, what do you mean? He said, their song, Not Gonna Die. I heard it. And I was like, yeah, you know what? I'm not going to die. I'm not giving up. And it's, it's amazing to me. And it, it sounds like you're, and correct me if I'm wrong, but did your podcast and like the start of writing the book kind of coincide time-wise? They did. Okay. So yes. is that is the podcast and the book are they both like going down the same train tracks like what was the what was what led you to actually write the book part of this Okay that's a good great question Here's why around 2011 or 12 I I I'm learning that a lot of people notice it and trace it back to that time but 2011 2012 is when I first was like okay what is happening <laughs> what in the world is going on and It was so foreign to me that I I literally just could not make heads or tails of it. And I began talking to pastors, talking to leaders. We began discussing. I began a deep dive into reading, into culture, philosophy. I mean, all the way from uh, Nietzsche to, to whatever. I mean, atheistic philosophy, looking into answers to try to find what was going on. And I might be embarrassed to say this, but I'm going to say it because it might encourage some people watching that have a passion for Christ but maybe you're not the smartest person in the world because I certainly am not. Okay. Um, It took me three years. I'm embarrassed to say (laughs) 2015. I said to my wife, I was writing a a brand new record and I had, I had this epiphany. I said to Corey, I said, Corey, I finally found out after all the theology and all the worldview stuff I've been reading, I finally found out what's wrong with culture. And I had no idea that we actually believe now in postmodernism. I mean, I had studied postmodernism in college because I love philosophy. I never knew anybody would believe postmodernism because it's, it's just so dumb. Uh, and I knew, I knew it made, I knew right. it made awesome films <laughs> like the matrix, <laughs> yeah. right? but I was like, no one would actually ever believe that. And the more I started reading, I was like, Oh, this isn't just like talk. People actually believe that there is no truth and that that you can't really know what is true for me, which is, mm-hmm. is basically relativism, which is, a, is an offshoot of postmodernism. So for, I'm sure people know this already, but for anybody who doesn't know what I mean, basically this, postmodernism says there is no truth, there is no reality, there's nothing that is absolutely good, therefore there's nothing that's absolutely bad. 
and it's all on how I perceive my life. Well, relativism takes it in a slightly different facet that says it's true, there's no absolute truth, but there is, um, there is relative truth. There's something that is absolutely, they wouldn't say absolute, they would say there's something that is a perceived truth. And that is when, when you bring that in with like a lot of the Marxist ideas, that is when you get this idea of group identity. And the group identity is who kind of makes all of us experience the same truth. So I know that that's really weird stuff. That is why I started going, okay, if I begin to read the Bible with postmodernism as my worldview, now the Bible is a totally different book. It's not the book that Jesus preached about. Uh, it's not the book that the apostles preached about or the prophets. This is a whole different book. And now I began to see why people are so confused. So yeah, my podcast and the book I wrote <clears throat> all started for those same reasons. Yeah, that kind of, that kind of leads in uh, uh, to the next thing I would I like to ask. Because uh, again, I, I for those of you who are listening, I'm a huge fan of the Cooper Stuff podcast. It actually helps me keep up with what's going on. Because uh, I'll be honest with you, John, you state things in a way that makes sense to the average person. Um, when it comes to cultures, I love listening to your podcast as a way to keep help me to keep up with what's going on, how it's affecting the church. But that kind of leads to the next thing I want, want to ask is, I believe in one of your podcasts or one of the articles you wrote, that you stated that the identity you belong to, the color of your skin, your gender, or your economic status cannot be a prerequisite for understanding the truth. Can you explain a little bit more what you mean by that? Yeah, you, it, it, that is in my upcoming book. And again, the book is called Awake and Alive to Truth. And, and basically, the, basically what the book is, it, it does have my journey. It has my testimony, how I, how I came to Christ. It has little stories, but it is mostly, it is mostly, uh, apologetic slash philosophy slash theology. It, it's kind of saying, here's how I came to Christ. And here are reasons that if you begin to look truth, uh, sorry, if you begin to look for truth based on our modern worldview, you cannot find it because our modern worldview says that it comes from a place that says that man is born good. And if man is born good, then that means I should be able to find truth on my own and I should be able to find what is good and what is virtuous? And so that can take you down a million different philosophies if you believe that man is good. All of them will be wrong. Well, the, one, of the, one of the prevailing philosophies of the day, and I appreciate that you said I, I say things that make normal people get it. I'm a normal people. I flunked out of college, okay? I'm not a smart person, but I read, I just like devour books, okay? The smart word for this is called standpoint epistemology. Standpoint epistemology is the smart word. If you want to have the normal word, it would be more like group identity. And what it means is that but if you are in a, a group identity that is marginalized, maybe like a minority culture or um, a woman or LGBTQ or whatever your marginalized position is, you have a group experience that, that majority culture or oppressor class, which would be like me, a white dude, basically, that I could never understand. I can never, it's not only that I can't understand where you're coming from, you have truth that I cannot have. That is the worldview of the time. And so what I was getting at was saying, even in churches, it's beginning to be almost like that the only person that can teach certain kinds of people are people who have had a life experience of something. And you can make that, you can make that in anything. For instance, the only person that could teach a, a class on um, how in, in the new life, God has given you a brand new, a brand new uh, body, right? He's made you a new creation. Would you agree? Sorry, not a brand new body. That's not true. Sorry. A brand new mind, not a brand new body. Excuse That's me. That's coming later. That's coming later <laughs> in the resurrection. And so I'm sorry. But That's what right. I meant to say was that God has made me a brand new creation. Therefore, the fact that John Cooper has never been addicted to drugs uh, does not mean that I can't preach to someone about how to, uh, about not being addicted to drugs, right? I hope this is an easy way to say it. Or I, I've never suffered, uh, I've never had to go into somewhere for depression. And the idea is that, well, if you've never suffered depression, then you can't preach to someone who suffers depression. You have to have experienced a thing to teach a thing. 
And I don't think that that's true. Otherwise, Jesus could not have been <laughs> our wonderful counselor, right? And But what it mean, what that does is, it might sound like I'm splitting hairs here, but I'm not. Because if you're listening to it saying, yeah, John, but you're splitting hairs, that means that the, that the secular worldview has already come into your, uh, into your mind. And it's already made you think, I, I haven't experienced that, so I can't know it. On a deeper level, what it really gets us to is this idea that, uh, of the oppressor class. And I think that that's what's, what's really dangerous. And it has made it into a way that the church no longer thinks that elders carry any sort of, of authority. Mm -hmm. Pastors don't, the words of the Bible don't carry any authority. I'll hear the words of the Bible, but, but I have the authority within myself to be self-governed. I'll hear the words of the Bible and, and I'll see if I agree. <laughs> so that is kind of where, where I'm going on that. We have to really dismantle those secular worldviews by coming back to the Christian worldview, which says that truth belongs to God. He is sovereign over truth. And whatever he says is absolutely right, even if it's unpopular, even if it offends people, even if it's not PC. Uh, and, and, and if uh, I think that I think I said that and I hope I said that in a way that makes sense about dismantling those secular worldviews. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. And uh, it sounds a little bit like uh, one of the things you've noticed and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but our culture has shifted from. Um, recognizing people as experts because they've studied something and it's shifted to you're an expert because you've gone through it 100 or you've experienced it and experiencing something doesn't make you an ex expert it just means that you were there at some point for it yeah. <laughs> um, I mean I've experienced a lot of things not an expert <laughs> not even a little bit yeah that you can make like uh, just a, a simple example of if you've gone through physical abuse doesn't mean you're an expert in counseling somebody in physical abuse. You actually said it better than I did. I wish I could go back and say what you said, and I could have like erased five minutes from this, from this Zoom meeting. Yeah, I'm uh, but, sorry. <laughs> no, I, but I, I, what I want to say is, is that, because I know a, a lot of youth pastors are watching, obviously we are not discounting how wonderful it is that by the grace of God, if you have been through a thing, that God can use that for, well, he will use it for good because the word says it, right? We know that all things work together for the good of those who love Christ according to his purpose. So we know that God in his sovereignty will use that for good if, if, under the lordship of Christ. So if you've been through a thing, it's wonderful that God can use you in that. But I do think the way you said it is right. Just because you've experienced it does not, not now mean that you have a different truth. That means you have a different experience. And I think that the way that young people, especially when I say young people I, these days, I really mean anybody under 40, to be honest, because even people in the thirties, millennial culture is saturated with social media, right? I mean, it's not like it's just 15 year olds, right? Yeah. Um, saturated with it. And so the way that they think, they don't think critically and they don't, they don't learn how to build arguments. And, and they haven't really been taught like worldview. So what they do is they turn on the news and they see a celebrity that is like, blah, 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 blah. Then they turn on a podcast and they hear somebody else say, blah, blah, blah. Then they hear a preacher say something different. Their parents say something different. Their teacher says something different. And they're like, oh my gosh, I got, I don't know what to believe. I got so many worldviews. And well, they said this and they've been through this. So they must be right. And they're listening to literally every voice. And I just want to, I've been encouraging some of them. Um, I work with young adults at my church uh, for the last two months because we're home. And I was like, I'll be a young adu adult pastor. I've got the time. I'm here. And I've been encouraging some of my young adults. You know what? I know that the world tells you it's great to get every opinion in the entire world and put it through your, your brain, word processor in your brain. That might not be the best idea. We'd all be in a better place if Eve had decided not to listen to the serpent's opinion. And maybe for a time, you need to just saturate yourself in the word, saturate yourself in the Bible and what the Lord is saying. And from leaders that you trust that have proven themselves to be men, um, you, you know, men of God or the women of God in your life and, or your parents or you know, whatever that situation is in this small groups, we do women's groups and men's groups. Listen to the people that you trust rather than, you know, <laughs> 
going online and finding out, you know, what Ellen DeGeneres said and, and holding it at e equal weight with the Apostle Paul. It's not a good idea, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And th this is amazing. It, it feels like you've already read the question I was just about to ask you because um, it, it's pretty well established. And I would agree with you. I actually love the way you said it, that um, it's amazing that people actually believe postmodernism. Um, yeah. And it's not just like a fun movie thing. But uh, I mean, it's pretty well established that we live in a culture that uh, it just compromises truth all over the place. Um, but we're now, and, and you've hit on this, but we're now living in a church culture where more and more Christian leaders, and, and not just like pastors of small churches, but Christian high-level leaders are compromising truth for the sake of relevance. So As if you were able to give like just one or two or 20 pieces of advice to youth leaders across our country who are, you, who are working with this next generation, uh, what advice would you give them in a truth compromising culture? I think that is absolutely awesome. And I did talk about this as well in my book. Um, I keep saying that just so people know the kind of things we talked about. The book is extremely evangelistic, by the way. Um, and it actually leads, hopefully I'll get there later in the interview, but it does lead to an actual gospel presentation as well to, to give people, here's the choice in front of you, death or life. All right. So it's, the book is very un-PC. In fact, I want to say this before I answer your question. This is how un-PC the book is. This is going to sound like I'm bragging. I'm not bragging. It's going to be self-deprecating by the end. Um, obviously, I have a platform. Skillet sold a lot of records. We've got big, pretty big social media numbers. I have my own social media numbers that are pretty good. Every book publisher I talked to was like, John, we really want to do a book with you. And every single one of them, when I gave them the book I wanted to write, every single one of them said, no, don't like it. <laughs> we want to do a book with you. Yeah, I remember hearing that when you, you shared this a little bit, in your, that same similar story on your podcast, when your episodes, but I am so thankful that you self-published. Because I, I, get, I get publishing companies are trying to sell a product. So I get it. Uh, but at the same time, I'm like, there is so much that needs to be spoken to culture and especially from a Christian publisher, you think they would be all gun haul. So yes, let's go at this move forward. So I'm so glad that you decided to self publish that way. You can <laughs> actually put in what you want to put into the book. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that a lot. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a funny story. It sounds like I'm bragging and then it's like, Nope, they hated it, but you're right. I mean, um, the reason I say that before I answer this, this question that David was asking is because I knew that, I knew that I had to write what the Lord was giving me. And the, the very fact that I could probably sell a lot more books by not writing it in order to make it more quote unquote relevant or PC speaks to exactly why I needed to write this book. Because basically, here's what the deal is. Culture has shifted so much that when I was growing up in the 80s, I was born in 75. It was just it was just a culture of, of hedonism. It was just live for pleasure, right? Like sex, drugs, rock and roll, baby. That's what it was. So standing for Christ, I don't mean that it was easy, but it was intellectually easy. You 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 knew how to stand for Christ in the 80s and 90s. You you didn't have sex outside of marriage. You didn't watch pornography. You didn't whatever, whatever. You didn't, you know, get wasted. All the all the things we know not to do in a hedonistic culture. The difference was is that people in that time, um, if you were being salt and light, as we love to say in Christianity, that's all you had to do. And so people maybe didn't like you because they felt you were too preachy. You were too goody goody. You all, oh, they're one of those, those good, good doers, you know, do gooders or whatever. That was the reason the world didn't like you then. Now that has changed because we live in a culture of, of humanism and we live in a culture now of just, do-gooderism, right? So we actually live in a culture in 2020 when people who hate Christ think that they are more virtuous than Jesus himself. They think that they are more virtuous than you. <laughs> so if you abstain from sex outside of marriage, they actually hate you not because you're, you're a goody-goody, but because you are um, mean and you are bigoted and you look down on other people who aren't as free as they are, all right? So what that means to me, going all the way back to the question, that's the, long, the longest setup ever to answer, how are we to be relevant to our youth now? You know what I believe? 
I believe if we don't explain to our kids what sin is, then we are being irrelevant for the gospel. I, I actually think that we're at a place that we are in sin if we don't just come out and say the unpopular truths of what the word teaches us. Because we it's not actually relevant. It's relevant to the world, but it's not relevant for Christ. And that to me is something that I've just had enough of it. And, and my advice to leaders like myself and hopefully anyone listening is I think we need to swallow the pill now. Remember what Jesus said um, to his disciples when he's like, <laughs> if the world hates you, don't be surprised. They hated me first. It's not actually you that they hate. They hate me. They hate my words. It's because the words themselves uh, are a two-edged sword. When you preach the gospel, the, the power of God and the presence of God is in the words themselves, right? Because they, they carry his authority. They carry his presence. So yeah, they're going to hate his words. Therefore, they're going to hate you. And I just think we need to swallow that pill now and realize that, that we're actually at a place that the world is going to hate you maybe more like in a way they used to hate Jesus, which is just different than it was 20 years ago. So my advice would be, I'm not saying that we're not to be loving. We absolutely should be. We should ex love people the way they are, but still tell them the truth. And so um, I hope that's encouraged. I hope that's not discouraging. I hope it's encouraging because it's actually really freeing. It's a really freeing thing to be like, you know what? I'm just going to swallow the pill now. The world is not going to like me. They're going to say that I'm not woke. They're going to call me a bigot. They're going to call me whatever. But that's okay because that's what truth is supposed to do. I, I would agree. It's, I think it's actually easier if you just stick with the Bible because then, then you don't have to <laughs> make anything up. But once yeah. again, that's what I should have said. No. Why don't you answer yeah. your own questions from now? <laughs> Next question. <laughs> stick with the Bible. Try that. <laughs> hey, you're yeah. right, though. I mean, we have to. And, and I've heard because you can stick with teaching the Bible and uh, still avoid stuff. Because there's a lot right. in there. So you can hit all the high, happy things. Um, but <laughs> yeah. if I'm understanding you correctly, we got to all of it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the reason why we kind of wanted to ask and kind of pick your brain on that question is because I don't, I don't know if, if it is, if David's seeing this, and I think David, we talked about it, and David's seen some of it. I don't know. If, I definitely know, that John, that you are, because you talk about constant in your podcast. Is I am seeing leader after leader after leader after leader in the Christian world just falling through when it comes and giving in to a lot of things in culture. Uh, I don't. I think it. To be honest with you, I haven't. And again, I'm not. I'm not that old. I'm only uh, 34, so I'm not that old. But it seems like in the last, in the last couple of years, really, maybe the last five, that it has been tremendous of how many leaders are just caving in to culture, whether it's, it's abortion, whether it's homosexuality, you name it. It's like they're, they're constantly compromising and you have that. And also you just have more and more of just leaders just walking away from the faith outright. And, yep. I, and it's actually, to my opinion, what I've been seeing, especially in the last six months with COVID uh, mixed in with the racial stuff that's been going on, I've been seeing more and more youth leaders that I am connected with uh, across the country saying things that I very, very shocked while they're saying on social media uh, and just just outright just compromising their faith and the Christian beliefs on this wave of being relevant to culture. Yes, agreed. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, it's devastating, isn't it? Um, it's heartbreaking. It's sad. I believe, I fully believe that we are already going through a, a civil war in the church. I'm not talking about America right now. I'm talking about the church. There is a split happening and it is over all the stuff that, that you just mentioned. And it's really heartbreaking. Because, and, and there's a lot of reasons that it is. All right. Um, one of the things, you know what? The word of God is unpopular. And in America, it's never been more unpopular than now. And again, what I was, what I was trying to explain about the humanism thing is um, versus hedonism. My generation, it was unpopular just because it ruined our fun, right? It ruined the fun. The word of God is unpopular now because it is deemed uh, immoral. They actually believe it's immoral. So for Christian youth leaders, 
Christian pastors, Christian speakers, to actually stand against that puts your job in jeopardy, and it puts your woke status online in jeopardy. It puts your, uh, you know, hey man, I don't like Jesus, but you're actually one of those Christians that actually is nice. You know that feeling that you get when people say that? That feeling that makes you think, oh, they think I'm a really good person, and what happens if I make a stand against X, Y, or Z? I'm gonna lose that status. Now I'm one of those judgmental Christians. It puts all of that in jeopardy. And it makes, it makes some Christian uh, church go, or some of the congregation, it makes them mad. What if they don't bring their tithe money? What if they don't want that youth, pass, that youth pastor in anymore? What if they don't like that pastor anymore? All of that is happening right now. And, and I have never seen this in my lifetime, never seen this kind of divide. It's really sad because I believe there's a lot of Christian pastors. I hope this doesn't sound too diabolical, but I'm just going to say it. I believe there's a lot of Christian pastors that have no earthly idea. They have no earthly idea about what they're talking about. I don't think they understand the secular movements that are happening of humanism. I don't think they understand the philosophies. I think they are using some of the words. Do you know what I mean? In other words, let me say it like this. They are confusing modern social justice with biblical justice. And when, mod- when social justice warriors use the word justice, they do not mean what Christians historically mean when they use the word justice. When they use the word oppressed, they do not mean what we think <laughs> when we talk about being oppressed, all right? Uh, it, all the words mean something different. So a, a lot of pastors don't know the damage they're doing. Some of them do because they just don't want to lose their job, unfortunately. Um, But it is scary stuff. And and I could go on about that for an hour. Uh, There's a fantastic resource. I wish I had it here. If if anybody listening wants to know an amazing resource, I got the book yesterday. I'm halfway through it. I wish I wrote it. It is called Social Justice is Not Biblical Justice. Uh, Look that up. Uh, or why why social justice isn't biblical justice? Honestly, it's so fantastic. It explains all these different movements. It's quite unpopular to stand for the word of God in a way that that's different than it's ever been in America right now. You said this earlier, and I just want to kind of hit on it again. And those of you who are listening, make sure you understand this: is that Christ died, was put to death because he was seen as offensive. He, what he was yes. saying was offensive. Um, so the gospel in itself is offensive to our culture. And I, I feel like that as Christian leaders, we try so hard, again, to be relevant, also not offensive, that we, it's almost we compromise the gospel, what the gospel is, to not be offend our our culture and I, and it's hard for me to really grasp because when you look at scripture read your bible look at christ he died because he was offensive to that culture he was offending the jews the jewish leaders wanted to put him to death because they saw him as a threat to their leadership and the role within uh judaism uh so I think you're right, right on, and I, and it's it's a scary time in our culture. Uh, but the the flip side of this as well is, I really think we're going to be entering a time and culture uh, for the church where we're going to be start seeing more persecution uh, within our church within the church as well. Which that sounds yep. bad. That sounds bad, and and from our flesh standpoint, it is bad. But when you look at all throughout church history, the church thrives during persecution. Um, I th- I think Absolutely. About, I'm thinking about all the, my missionary friends uh, that are overseas or in some, some of these places where it's, where it's dangerous to be a Christian, and they're seeing people being arrested and interrogated and persecuted. Uh, but in those areas, you don't hear this on the news, of course, and the media doesn't talk about this, but in those areas, the church is thriving. Uh, but yes. unfortunately, I see us in America moving that direction slowly but surely. I um, absolutely agree. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, go, go ahead. Go ahead, David. Um, I was just going to say, like, through this COVID, it seems like a lot of the cultural Christians have finally dropped off. 
um, the ones that did it for the uh, kind of what you said, like in the in the early 80s and the 90s, the, the ones that did it because it felt good and it was culturally advantageous to them. Um, since it's no longer advantageous, they're they're like, all right, well, I can quit now. <laughs> Well, I think you're. I think you're right. Uh, I, I want to touch on on that and something that Ryan just said. Uh, I I've talked about uh, what you just said, Ryan, in my one of my podcasts. I I do think that we are headed towards some different kinds of persecution that we have not seen before. And I, but I also agree with you. I, I think it's worth. I think it's worth standing up for because we have a great country where we have a voice, and it is wonderful that we can. We do live in, in, a, in a we do live in a country where we should be free to preach Jesus, just like the left should be free to preach atheism. It, it's a great uh, natural government. We should fight for that. But if we do enter into that time of persecution, God is going to use it to save people. He's going to use it to bring people into Christ because the gospel will once again cost you something, and the gospel hasn't costed as much. In America, over these times, when the gospel costs you something, then you then you're you're in New Testament church, right? They didn't even, they didn't love their lives even unto death. Now, I at that point, I believe you begin to see revival. I think that's good. And I also want to touch on this because you mentioned something. I can't remember. It got it got my brain working. Uh, my ADD caused me not to remember what it was, but <laughs> I think it's worth mentioning that I I don't think a lot of a lot of church leaders quite understand the war that is happening. They, they, they think, yeah, there's a spiritual war. Like, yeah, but it's, it's different than it was 10 years ago because, uh, b- b- because this war is coming against the gospel in a way that, just that it did it. And just to give people an idea of what I mean when I say justice doesn't mean the same thing. I want to I give you an idea because I, I read like crazy. And so if you don't want to go read a bunch of books, just understand this. When the world talks about justice, Here's what they mean. They mean that, um, for instance, poor areas, poor areas in America don't uh, make this, have the same money as richer areas. Therefore, it is justice to put more Planned Parenthoods into minority communities so we can kill more babies. And if you don't put more Planned Parenthoods in those things, then you are committing injustice against a group of people. Um, another idea would be what you've probably seen. There's a, something happening this year down in Texas. There's a divorced couple, and the the son of, of the divorced couple lives with the mom. I believe he's 12 years old. Wants to begin uh, uh, gender trans uh, drugs to change gender into becoming a girl. The dad doesn't want to do it. He is being sued to, to make him pay for the transition to begin. And it's gone to court because what it is, is he is doing injustice against that child for not letting that child make autonomous decisions. So when the world talks about oppression, they're talking about something different than Christian. See, Christians believe that it is oppressive to let children make decisions to change their, their bodies for the rest of their lives. That is actually what oppression would be, but the world changes what it is. So you have a lot of Christian preachers up there going, we're helping the oppressed, not knowing that they actually are preaching something that is oppressive according to God, even though the world says that they're virtuous for doing it. So I just wanted to say those examples to bring it home to people understand that is the war that is going on. Yeah, you're right. And that's an, that's direct fulfillment of what scripture talks about, like in Romans one, where they've exchanged the truth of God with a lie. Yes. Um, and so I'm mean, half of what you've said, you could attach a biblical reference to it um, because you're hitting on stuff that the new Testament constantly talks about, you know, gathering preachers that are going to tickle their ears and, and, and have them hear what they want to hear kind of stuff. And, and, and as far as the relevancy thing is concerned, I, I would agree with you. I actually think the Bible's more relevant now because our culture's starting to look more like it did in first century church with the Roman persecution. Um, I, I would call what we have right now a soft persecution because they're just yelling and screaming at us. Yes. Um, it'll get physical eventually. Um, but and I've heard of stories here and there, but it's something um it's something that we, we used to when we were kids we heard about every once in a while. And now <laughs> we're seeing it daily. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll say this real quick as as we kind of kind of wrap up. Um, but I, I since COVID has started, I uh, I have seen things when it comes to our local governments, state governments that I never thought I would see before when it comes to targeting churches. So that's the reason why, to me personally, again, I'm probably wrong, and I hope I am, that I see in the future that this has actually opened doors for possible more target attacks when it comes with the church. I think COVID has kind of opened those doors. Uh, you, like you have an um, example, I think it's somewhere in California, I forget, to this, either San Diego or San Francisco, I can't remember, um, up the top of my head, that basically told their uh, said churches cannot sing. Okay, so you can't sing. Yeah, right. you can, only can have 10 people who can't do this, can't do that. And it's really dog hearted attacking the church. But yeah, we can go, we can go to Walmart. We can do all this, wear a mask, go there, but the church can't do nothing. And so it was, it was very much targeted. <laughs> and uh, well, you, you can't get, co- you can't get COVID if you're looting. Yeah. Yeah. That too. Uh, then that, yeah, that coming out. So you're, you're seeing some, some, things I never thought I would see in my lifetime that COVID's kind of opened the doors with. And of course, this whole entire situation, I'm not trying to dim me down COVID. COVID, there's people dying from it. There's people who are getting sick and affected, family members. I got people I know who have family members that have passed away from it. Uh, but it has, in my opinion, kind of opened the door a little bit for a little bit more persecution in the church that I didn't think I would see in my lifetime. You're right, Ryan. You, and you know what's interesting? Because it, it, it goes back to what we were just talking about. What's been really interesting is to see that some Christians were standing against that, which I'm sure John MacArthur and people, mm-hmm. if you've been, you know, people have been following. What's really weird is to see the amount of Christians who came against John MacArthur. Did, did you see some of those oh, things? Yeah. Even people like um, Al Mohler and people who, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm I mean, I think it's okay if we name names. So he said it out in public. Um, who we we would listen to about a lot of things began coming out with articles saying, "No, the church shouldn't be doing this." And it puts lay people, it puts ordinary people like I, I don't know what to say, I don't know what to do. One of the things that that uh, that, that again, I do talk about in, in the book. This book is great for young people because it, it has a lot of ordinary examples, like day everyday example so mm-hmm. people can understand the world we're living in and how to find Christ. One of the things that it does talk about is that eventually, even if you try to meet, uh, you know, uh, David, I don't remember how you called it, but whatever you said, which I agree with, which is kind of to- totalitarianism coming in, the persecution. I, I read a book called um, uh, Live Not By Lies that, that just came out recently, but it's saying that we already live in a soft totalitarianism, what we live in. A lot of people don't know the danger of it because, as you said, right now it's just mean words. It's people yelling. It's people yelling on on this. Some people are losing their jobs, but not like a ton yet. But that will just keep advancing. Well, some Christians think, well, that's okay, guys, because we need to meet people halfway. And to me, like the idea of not opening churches up indefinitely forever, not singing at church, to me, that is kind of like we're going to meet people halfway to show them that we love people. And what I have been encouraging people to do, I know different people may disagree about this, but I've been encouraging people is this, go ahead and bite the bullet now that they are not going to like you. You can meet them halfway if you want to now, but on the ne- when the next level comes, you'll have to eventually end up making a stand. It will cost you in the end. They're not going to like, oh, they're the good people because they were on our side. All you have to do to know if that's true is go back and read a little history of, of Marxism uh, and Marxist revolutions with Lenin or Stalin or Mao, any of those revolutions start out with this, maybe we can meet halfway. Maybe, maybe we can only push the, the good parts of communism, but it always ends up with death and it always ends up with gulags, you know? It's, it's going to end bad in the end. And so I've been encouraging Christians, go ahead and take your stand now. Go ahead and take your stand now and, and encourage as many people as possible to draw their swords, figuratively speaking, of course, um, to draw their swords, which is the word of God, and stand on it. That's exactly right. So I, I think that that's pretty important. So in the book, I don't talk about you know communists or regimes or anything like that, but I do talk about uh, um, practical ways that, that 
you will not be able to find truth this way. It is going to end badly. And throughout the book, uh, well, I'll mention that later if I need to, or else I'll just move on. But I do think it's important for Christians to realize the choice that's before you now. It is quite literally, it is a lot more like the early church. We've never seen this in our country before. This isn't like, I'm being persecuted because people made fun of me for not having sex at high school. It's not like that now. This is like, you might lose your job if you stand up for Christ, or if you are unwilling to, to, to bend the knee with some sort of, uh, you know, I just read this week, I wish I could remember what business it was, one of these high-tech, it wasn't Google, but it was one of these high-tech companies that is actually making you sign something before you go on saying that, yes, I will, not just that you won't be discriminatory towards anybody, but that you will embrace and promote. For instance, you have to now promote LGBTQ or you have to promote whatever it is. You have to sign a paper saying you will do it just to work at the company. Now the Christian has to decide, do I want to sign a paper saying that I will bow the knee to do something that I don't know what it's going to cost me later? You know, the old, the old, biblical, <laughs> the old biblical stance would be uh, no, but the new relevant stance says, well, love thy neighbor, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I, no, I agree, man. I, I absolutely agree. Yeah. Um, I don't know when we started equating love with being wishy-washy. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, no, that's fine. It's okay. I love you. It's like, such a miss. You know what? Can I, bra- can, I, can I promote my book one more time, David? I have a chapter in my book that talks about this. Uh, and, the, the name, and the reason is, is because the book is talking about all these different Different ways you can try to find truth. And the world says now that it's all about love, right? It's all about love. And even Christians now are embracing and saying, that's true, love thy neighbor. And so I wrote, um, I wrote a whole chapter on it. And the name of the chapter is called Love is Not God. And it is based on A.W. Tozer. Uh, uh, there is an A.W. Tozer chapter on, on uh, Knowledge of the Holy, which is an amazing book about the attributes of God, where he talks about this. So I borrowed the quote, and, and it's just saying, you, you can't not define love and then just, just use the word love for anything in the entire world. Because as we said, then true love means let, letting your eight-year-old boy begin to take hormones to change his body. That's what love is according to the world. You know, love is um, saying, you know, I, I just read this during the uh, riots because I live in Kenosha, and we had protests that turned violent. Play, three blocks away, three people got, got shot. Two people got killed three blocks from my house during these riots. And somebody posted something saying that they were loving their neighbor by, listen, wait for this. You're not going to believe it. It was in the Milwaukee newspaper. Um, he basically looted his own business to stand against systemic racism. <laughs> because this is what it means to love your neighbor. And I, I, this is the world we live in now. So I wrote a whole chapter about this. I think it could be really great for young people to, to, so they will understand that's not what you have to define love and, and, and then you go from there. And so it talks about justice. It talks about eternal punishment. It talks about the fact that a God that does not punish wickedness can't actually be infinitely righteous. So it talks about a lot of important things, I think, especially for young people, very evangelistic. I think this is going to be a book that takes me less than a month to read. <laughs> <laughs> it will Instead definitely take to, you less six than to nine months, months like yeah. it usually does. Yes. Yes. <laughs> One thing I'm excited about, um, about getting this as a resource is, is for, I think it's just very good hand in the hands of teenagers, uh, specifically to understand culture a little bit more when it comes to a biblical worldview, because I just like where we've been talking throughout this entire time, this conversation that they're so confused of yes. what, what does God's word, what does God expect of me? Because we're seeing all this in the culture, all this compromising within the Christian church, uh, especially, and I, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to pick on people, but the celebrity pastors, now all of them are yes. doing this. But the celebrity pastors, a lot of them are falling in line when it comes to a lot of these uh, cultural issues and compromising. And they're seeing this 
Uh, they're seeing this on TV, social media, uh, and they're com just confused. I've had many conversations with teens that, that's one in particular that was watching a short clip um, from a pastor, very prominent pastor, saying stuff that wasn't quite heresy, but was right on the edge of getting there. Mm -hmm. And I uh, was asking questions, like, is this true? And I had to look at him and said, no. And they were like, how do you know? Read your Bible. Let me show you where God's Come word says. And, Come um, on now. But yep. it's, it's, they're, they're confused. A lot of them are confused. And a lot of them, because we, Generation Z particularly, and millennials are this way too, um, but especially Generation Z, is that they're very proactive uh, when it comes to culture, when it comes to things going on. That's the reason why when you look at all these riots, prom they're, most of them are millennials and Gen Zers. Yeah. When you when you look mm -hmm. across the board, look just look at all the videos. From, really, they look like they're thirty, twenty year olds and teenagers around that range, because yeah. most of them that age group and that generation are very proactive when it comes to culture. So because of that, all, all your your teenagers, different generation Z, are proactively following what's going on in culture, and through that. They're confused on what actually is going uh, from a biblical. What is a biblical worldview compared and connected to our culture? Yes, absolutely. I think that some of that comes from the fact that we, I don't think we do a good enough job teaching worldview. And sometimes we might think, oh, that's, that's, that's intellectual or that's that. I don't know if that's really as important as, uh, having another story, you, you know, we, we tend to tell a lot of stories at church and then we pick out a verse and we, and we use the verse a lot of the times incorrectly to prove what we want, but I know good heartedly, but it's because we're not really teaching worldview. And so I was having a conversation funny enough with my pastor who frankly was like, I think that he thinks that I can be, uh, he doesn't think that my opinions are extreme, but he's like, sometimes, John, it seems like you're being really polarizing and uh, because I do come out really passionate about stuff. And but he, here's the interesting thing that, that you just touched on, Ryan, is that here's the thing. I'm not being polarizing because I still believe what I believed 20 years ago and what all of everybody else in Christ, Christendom believed 20 years ago. It's the new people that are being polarizing because they are changing everything. and so. What happens is that I think a lot of good Christian, good Christian pastors who truly love people, they don't want to, in other words, when all this new stuff comes out and people come out and they say, hey, here's the deal, you know, just like last week, as you said, I don't want to be rude. I love a lot of these people. Sorry, I get really passionate and then I sound like I'm mean. I'm actually not mean. I love, I'm very gracious to people to disagree with me, but somebody will come out just like they did last week and say, hey, here's the deal. Um, abortion kills people, but so does being prideful like that's ridiculous that's a ridiculous statement in terms of what that will mean for 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 culture right um somebody being prideful will not kill millions of people in the same way that abortion kills people right so what i'm saying is like wait a minute you're the one that came out and said something like really crazy and all of the nice pastors who love people and people like me we love people we go, I don't want to be rude. I don't want to be polarizing. Then it just makes people split apart. But I'm like, no, no, we're still in the same place we were. They're the ones now saying, hey, Jesus is real, but the Bible isn't necessarily accurate. Jesus is real, but a God that loves people would never send someone to hell. Or I read something recently that said it was on transgenderism. It was saying, it was saying the it was saying the opposite of the truth. It was saying God makes us the way we are. And if God has created somebody's, somebody's brain to think that they are a girl, but they're, that they're born with male genitalia, then the loving thing to do is to allow them to have a surgery to become what God made them to be. I was reading it like, you're the one changing all the stuff. All that we're doing is staying in the same position. You're making it polarizing. And if we don't come out and, and say the truth, I guess I'm just in this place that I don't, I don't like the polarization. I don't like the anger. I don't like the yelling, but I'm like, but you guys are the ones saying a bunch of new weird things. You know, you're, 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 you're changing stuff that makes it sound like here's another one that we hear all the time. People are beginning to use all of the white fragility language into Christianity. All, all of the famous pastors are like the people online. 
And I'm like, I need you to say clearly, are you using, what definition are you using? Because if you're using white fragility's definitions of those words, you just said that Jesus set aside his privilege, his advantage, his unearned advantage, sort of like we have white privilege. You're saying that Jesus set aside his, you know, um, oppressor advantage and came so that he could identify with oppressed minority groups. That is all this. That is not the gospel. But, but, but I agree that we are all oppressed by sin, but if we're oppressed by sin, then what that means is that the, the rich white guy is just as oppressed as the poor minority, whatever person that, that doesn't eat for the week or whatever. We are all oppressed by sin, and now you are reshaping the gospel. You people are the ones that are making this polarized. It's not us. So I think, that, I don't know, I feel really passionate about that, to tell you the truth. I feel kind of like, no, <laughs> I'm, not being, I'm not being crazy. I'm saying the same thing we've always said. You guys are saying weird stuff, man. <laughs> you're right. You're right. Nothing has changed. The Bible hasn't changed. Like, nothing is different. Everything that we're saying that is the truth from Scripture, we've been saying for 2,000 years. Yes. And yeah. it's, it's not – like, we haven't budged. It's the ones that – like, I use an analogy with my teens where I put three chairs on the stage and God's on one, Christians are in the middle, and then the world's on the other one. And as the world gets further and further away from God – a lot of Christians tend to try to straddle the fence and stay halfway in between. What they don't realize is the further, the, the more they stay halfway, they're actually moving further and further away from the Lord in reality. Excellent. And God's over there like, I haven't moved. I haven't budged. <laughs> yeah. I'm still here. My standard's still the same. I actually literally told you I don't change um, in my word. So I'm not the problem. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, that is a fantastic uh, thing uh, picture i love that i might use it if you don't mind sometimes go for it i stole it from somebody else <laughs> <laughs> and then i'll tell people i made this up i'm a genius there you go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just like you know every great pastor should um no i think that that's wonderful and, and 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 as i go through you know in this book um i do think it's a great resource for young people because it is so it's easy to understand in fact one of the publishing houses that turn it down. They're like, yeah, this isn't our thing. And they said, if I could give you any criticism, John, I would just say, Hey, this book feels too young. And I said, good, because that's who my audience is. I want to write a book that, that people that don't want to sit with John Calvin or, or, or they can't understand a John Piper book maybe, or whatever, you know, all these amazing people that I've learned from a lot of young people don't want to read that or they don't understand how, right? Augustine and people. So it goes through that, that picture that, that you just said. We are getting farther away from God. The more we go into humanism uh, and the more we think that we can reach virtue on our own, you're getting actually farther away from God because we are all stained from sin. So whatever we think is good that is based on our flesh is going to end up actually being evil. So I just posted something on my social media on Monday, I believe I posted. is a quote from my book that says, um, the Christian who does not know what God loves and hates is in danger of believing that God endorses evil things. And I was amazed at the amount of Christians that were mad at me. I thought that all the Christians would be like, "Woo, amen. And, and a lot of them were, but a lot of Christians were like, John, why are you saying such hateful things? God loves people and this and this. And I was like, do you really believe that God doesn't hate sin? Like, have you ever cracked open the Bible ever? So um, it goes through those things. And I just want to mention one more thing in case anybody out there, I didn't say it clear enough. I don't think I need to. But when I was referencing that article that said that uh, abortion and, and pride killing people, I was talking about on earth. Uh, 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 yes, pride, kill is, is, pride will kill you just like murdering someone will eternally. But I was talking about the effects on a culture, okay? In case anybody's like, John doesn't know the Bible. That, that is actually a very good and true point. And I discussed that in the book too. The, the book discusses original sin. And I sent it to um, a theologian friend of mine called James White. Do you know who James White is? Yes, the dividing line. Yeah, dividing line. Yes. I just had him on my, my Cooper Stuff podcast this week. That's and exciting. I, he's one of the only people that has read my entire book. 
and because uh, he gave me notes and told me where I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but he hit me back after reading my chapter on original sin. He said, John, you do know that people are going to be so mad at you uh, for this chapter. And I was like, how can Christians not believe in original? Good. And he's like, everybody's going to be mad. And I said, good, because if you can, if you can grasp original sin, then you can grasp the gospel. Absolutely. It feels like throughout the history of the church, people named John uh, tend to tick people off. John the Baptist, <laughs> John Calvin, John Piper, John Cooper. Right. It's a right. good name to to spread truth unapologetically and tick people <laughs> off in the process. <laughs> if I have oh another son, I'm going to name him John, maybe. I don't know. And, you know, speaking of that, I, I would like to brag on John Piper for one minute in case it sounds like I, I am a huge John Piper fan. And uh, something that I, I will say just because I know it sounds like I'm being a little doggish there. I, I, I didn't like that statement. But this week, <clears throat> did you guys see the Wayne Grudem response to John Piper? Did, anybody, did you guys see that? I have not seen that yet, but I heard it about it. It popped up. I haven't had a chance to read it yet. Yeah. Uh, it, it's fantastic. Check it out. And uh, I'm also a Wayne Grudem fan as well. Uh, but um, you know what I loved about it? Well, I love the whole statement. At the end, Wayne Grudem says that after he wrote his response, he sent it to John Piper for John Piper to read and make sure that it was honoring before he put it out. And then he says that John Piper said, yes, I'm fine with it as it is, but I would like to give you even more ammunition against what I wrote because you made a point, but I think you could make it even better and gave him notes. Now I got to say that is humility. I love to see how many of us would have that kind of humility. So I, I do even though I, I was upset about the one thing, I want to say how much I love Piper, how much I, I just think that that is a beautiful picture of humility. I, I want to be more like that myself. No, absolutely. Well, John, we can talk about this all second day. I love talking about culture and it just affects the church because it's very relevant to what we're dealing with right now in the church. But as we wrap up, I want to just to ask, how can people get connected with you and your new book? I would love to tell you that. First of all, I appreciate what you guys are doing. I think it's so needed. I met with a youth pastor here in town, um, and I also met with a pastor in town that are both saying, how can we do stuff like this? And so um, I think this is fantastic, and I would like to I'll, I'll forward this over to him as well because I don't know if he's aware of this. But this is really needed and really necessary. And I know that people are freaking out. Youth pastors are freaking out. I wanna thank youth pastors for standing your ground for Christ and saying, you know what, I'm gonna, uh, no matter what it costs, I am going to do my, my job and I'm gonna stand for truth and help. I, I believe that what you're doing is snatching people from the fire. I really do. Sort of like uh, it says in Jude, I believe that we're in that kind of a time. It's very important. So thanks for having me on. The one and only place you can get my book now is on my website. And that is johnlcooper.com slash awake. johnlcooper.com slash awake. Uh, and, and that's my website. You can find all sorts of stuff on there anyway. My podcast that you alluded to is called Cooper Stuff Podcast. Spotify, um, you know, um, Apple Podcasts, whatever, YouTube, Cooper Stuff Podcast. Other than that, um, Instagram is also John L. Cooper. Well, John, I just want to appreciate you for taking your time to come on the podcast today. It's so cool talking to you guys. Thanks for doing what you do. Keep it up. And I'm so glad you had me on, man. Well, guys, I, I'm really thankful for John and his heart and just his courage to be able to address these issues uh, knowing that it can potentially hurt him uh, for as a band and hurt his platform. But beyond honesty, he says this many times on his podcast and openly that he doesn't care because he's all about speaking truth. Yeah, he's staying faithful to the word and to his Lord. And, and he's not trying actively to be an offensive person, but... I appreciate his take on a lot of the topics that we talked about because he came at it from a biblical worldview and a, a biblical perspective and, and not the kind of biblical perspective that you would think of like, oh, he just threw a Bible verse at it, but 
actually like a well thought through uh, discussion and argument about the topics that he covers, not only in his book, but on his podcast and, and even the approach that he had with uh, how he runs his band. I mean, it's just incredible to see someone who is actively trying very hard to uh, reach a lost and dying world unapologetically. And in my opinion, doing that all while not being a jerk about it. (laughs) (laughs) He's actually like a genuine guy. I I love it. And even when we talked with him off air um, before and after the interview, I mean, it's just, he's a genuine guy and he's got a great sense of humor. And can we just talk about that beard for a second? I mean, (laughs) I'm a little jealous. I know you're not supposed to be, but I, I cannot make that happen. So I would encourage you, uh, if you haven't pre-ordered it yet, or if you missed out on the Black Friday deal, please, uh, please get this book, um, because I think it's going to be a great tool, not just for you, but also for the teens and the youth group. So um, if you are a longtime listener, thank you. Hopefully this was an exciting interview for you to listen to. I think it's awesome to be able to get a guy like John Cooper, who's the, the lead singer and the bass player of an amazing Christian band. Um, And if you have not yet, please leave a rating and a review. We'd really appreciate that because that allows us to continue to bring solid content to people who are looking for it on all the podcast platforms. And uh, we would, we would love to hear from you, get your thoughts um, on the podcast and uh, we'd really appreciate it. Well, guys, I want to let you know, we're giving away several books personally signed by John Cooper. And there's two ways that you can actually enter this giveaway. The first one is basically just to give us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. And when you give us a rating and review, just direct message us on Facebook or Instagram at Youth Culture Podcast. And just let us know what your username or your ID that you used when you gave us a rating. So that's the first way. The second way is just to go on our Facebook page and like and share the Facebook post. To like and share the Facebook post. That's two ways you can enter the giveaway. And if here in a few weeks after this episode has been released, we're actually going to give away. Let's let y'all know who has won the giveaway for a free book personally signed by John Cooper. And well, guys, I am looking forward to the next year. We have a great lineup of interviews uh, uh, for the next physical year. And one of those being Nona Jones, who is the faith-based director of Facebook. And we're going to be talking about social ministry, how to have a ministry on social media and what that looks like and how to be more effective in reaching parents and teens through social media. So I'm really excited about that episode, that interview coming out. And we have a few others coming out as well. That I'm really, really excited. I do want to let you know for the month of December, we're actually going to be taking a little bit of a break here on the podcast. Uh, part of that is, is me and me and uh, David are going to be spending a little more time with our families, but also we want to uh, produce more content and get some content ready for the next year. Well, guys, stay tuned for our next episode.